you want to explore some of the principles that govern a victorious Christian life. The first principle I want to share with us today is a principle of the exchanged life or living the life of Christ in us. Living the life of Christ in us. Galatians 2, 20 to 21. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, in this tent, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. The Apostle Paul here remarks that he has been crucified with Christ. The old Saul of Tarsus, the aggressive Saul of Tarsus who persecuted the church, recognizes that in Christ he died. Christ died his death. He took away his sins and nailed them to the cross. He was in Christ when he died. The old man, the old Adamic nature had been crucified with Jesus. Consequently, he no longer lives, but Christ lives in him. Paul the Apostle is saying, yes, at the cross, Jesus had me in mind. He took my sins upon himself. At the cross, there was divine exchange. All our theology will fall short of unpacking the import of Calvary, the import of Golgotha. There was, spiritually speaking, some divine exchange happening. The sinless Lamb of God was made to become sin. He did not commit sin, but was made sin because all our iniquities were laid upon Him. Isaiah, in his fifth, third chapter, elaborates the experience of the suffering servant of God, the Lamb of God. So he took our sins upon himself. He took away our condemnation. He took away the guilty and the penalty that was duly ours. Instead, he gave us in exchange eternal life. As many as believe in him have now eternal life. He took us and granted us to experience a new life in Christ. I have been crucified. So when you believe in Christ Jesus, you've been crucified with Jesus. The old Adamic rebellious nature has been crucified with Jesus. So Paul tells us, I no longer live to do my bidding. I am not the one who has the last word on matters in my life. I don't even call the shots in my life. I submit to him who loved me and died for me while I was yet a sinner. The life now I live in the body, I don't live to please myself. I don't live to fulfill my own soulish and fleshly appetites. I have been crucified. That has been nailed to the cross. I died his death. I no longer live. You know, a dead person has no will. They are done with sinning. A corpse cannot sin, can they? A dead person cannot sin. They have no will. They are gone. They are submitted to the caregivers. Whichever way you position the body, that's where it will be. However you dress it, the body does not even have a choice over which coffin to be buried in. It is done. It has no will of itself. It submits. Even to the extent some people choose to cremate and the corpse doesn't protest. It doesn't even say, ouch. Nikubaya leo. It's submitted. It has no life of its own, totally yielded to the whims of others. The same way you reckon yourself to be dead in Christ. That your soulish will, 
your own impulses, your own appetites have been crucified with Christ, yet you live. And not you, but Christ who lives in your life. That's the picture Christ had in mind. That the life now I live, Paul will tell us, is not for my own self-righteousness. Now, Paul was a man of passion. As the persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus, he persecuted the church with zeal, with zest, with gusto. He pursued them all the way from Jerusalem and he's headed to Damascus. From wherever they were found, he pursued them. He had, was a self-righteous, self-centered Pharisee from Tarsus, the city of Tarsus. But when he had an encounter with the Lord, he turned that negative zeal, that negative energy, that energy that the enemy used to torture the church, now he directed it to the kingdom of God. Paul was now a man of great passion. Great commitment, great zeal, great determination. That's the only thing he never lost in the exchange. His old selfish life was taken away. He now gained a new life. In Christ, during that divine exchange, Christ took our sins. He made them his very own. He was condemned consequently. In exchange, he gave us his righteousness. Not out of your acts of religiosity, not your good works. All our good works are filthy rags. The very finest of us in terms of etiquette and conduct and morality, all our acts of righteousness is filthy rags in the presence of God. They fall far below the standards of God. But when we trust in Jesus, our filthy garments, our acts of righteousness that are don't measure and are of no consequence are exchanged for Christ's righteousness. This is what we call imputed righteousness. You have a right standing now with God. No devil can tune you. No accuser can tune you anymore because now you have the righteousness of Christ. It, you are complete in Him. Simply by trusting in God, you live an exchanged life. He took your penalty. He took your guilty. He took your sin. And that was nailed to the cross. We died with Him but rose triumphantly with Him. But Paul does not deny here the fact that this life, this new reality is lived in the flesh. He performs the natural functions of the flesh, but he says, this is not my real life. His life in the flesh is not a life after the flesh. Can I repeat that again? Paul's life in the flesh, in this tent, in this dwelling, in this container, is not a life after the flesh. In other words, he's not pursuing the appetites and the desires of the flesh. This life he now lives by faith for, of the Son of God who loved him and died for him. The import of what we are saying today, my brothers and sisters, has far-reaching ramification. It means that the exchange life should affect your conversations. It should affect your thinking pattern. It should affect how you conduct yourself. Your speech should be wholesome. Your words should not be the casting words the world is used to. Your demeanor must totally change because now it's not you who live. You are a corpse. Your old nature is kaput. You're dead, but you have a new nature in Christ that should be used to glorify God in heaven. The exchange life in Christ should affect entirely your life. It should influence your speech. It should determine who you marry, singles. Amen? It should determine who you hang out with. It should determine your business partner. Because the Bible is very clear. Do not be deceived. 
bad company ruins good morals. The exchange life that you live today is the life of Christ. Who are you living for? Who do you desire to please? What's your greatest aspiration? What's your greatest desire? It's very possible, my brothers and sisters, to be born again. You've trusted in Christ Jesus, but you live a very carnal life. Very carnal Christian. You want to organize your life around your own conveniences at the expense of everybody else to the inconvenience of everybody else. That is self-centeredness. Everybody can be inconvenienced, but you, you've, you have your way. We must learn to surrender. I think that God is challenging us today to reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ. That the old Adamic nature that sometimes tries to rule our lives has been done with. We begin a new life in Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives and me. The life now I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. As long as you stay in the natural plane, in the natural level, you can never win spiritual battles. The devil comes in through the flesh. As I said, we've been given power and authority to resist the devil and when we resist him, he flees from us. The devil comes in through the flesh, the old Adamic nature. This is where we get ensnared. And if we dwell in the natural level, in the, in the fleshly level, we will never experience spiritual victory. The key to your great victory is a life that is surrendered, that is yielded to God. A life that has been crucified with Christ, that has now experienced a new beginning in Christ. Christ.